Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, thanks, Dima, for the introduction, and thanks to Christian for for being responsible for this program. Uh, I would like to uh, to start by giving my own uh, account of what IPAM means for me, uh, since this is the first talk. And uh, I think this will be useful since I think half of the audience at least is new to IPAM. So I would like to give my own view from a, a scientist a point of view. So. My relationship with IPAM uh, goes back a long time. I came here first time to a long program in 2005. This was a program uh, not unrelated completely to this. This was about uh, uh, multi-scale modeling actually in physics, chemistry, and biology, which is in fact very much related, just that there is machine learning everywhere now. Uh, that's the difference. <laughs> Um, but then I actually was here for two more long programs in 2011. Uh, so I came first as a PhD student. In 2011, I was a postdoc, and I actually met my postdoctoral supervisor here at IPAM, uh, Matthias Schaffler. Um, um, and then in 2016, I was the chair of a program, which was also actually about machine learning and physics, uh, uh, but a bit more maybe confined to uh, quantum uh, simulations of molecules and materials. And this program is much broader. Uh, and so really it has shaped my scientific career and a lot of the things I will be showing in my talk have been either started here or motivated by discussions at IPAM. Uh, I also met many of my current collaborators here, Anatol von Lilienfeld who is sitting there, uh, Klaus Müller, whom we met here, who was explicitly invited by the science board of IPAM. Um, and so um, really, from my personal uh, perspective, IPAM is this unique place, right, that brings people together from many different disciplines. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, it also gives you a lot of luck because for some reason, uh, most of my uh, biggest grants were always accepted while I was at IPAM, um, <laughs> which might mean that uh, I come here too often or uh, that actually IPAM gives you luck. And I think it's superposition of both um, in my case. Um, uh, and then so I'm happy to be back and uh, give this first lecture of the first workshop. Uh, which kind of tries to combine three different topics that fit very tightly into this program. So I will talk about quantum mechanics, in particular quantum mechanics of large molecules and materials, so about emergence of new effects when you actually go from small molecules or well-ordered materials to realistic systems such as proteins, uh, such as nanostructures and so on. So I want to spend some time defining uh, what quantum mechanics means and how uh, the different effects uh, uh, interplay in terms of scales, uh, both spatial scales and temporal scales. Then the second topic is chemical space. So quantum mechanics is really the mechanics of everything, right? We have to start from quantum mechanics. Classical mechanics is just a uh, coarse graining of quantum mechanics in the end. But of course, we want to apply quantum mechanics throughout chemical space, and that really changes um, our view because we want to understand how quantum properties evolve in large chemical spaces and then use those uh, properties to actually design molecules and materials with tailored functionality. And finally, we think that machine learning will get us there to achieve this uh, important goal. And so this is the third topic of my talk. And since I have finite time, let's see where I get in terms of these three topics. Okay, so before I start, I want to give sort of a very broad overview of how we do things today, which is still the state of the art in the context of modeling molecules and materials from first principles of quantum mechanics. Then I will say where we want to go tomorrow, how we think machine learning will change the way we do things, and then I will get to real science. Um, so today, uh, if you look at the wide literature of atomistic modeling in chemistry and physics, it goes sort of something like this. So you are given a molecule, and this molecule is defined by positions of its atoms and the nuclear charges. For example, this molecule has two carbon atoms, four hydrogen atoms, which are these white spheres, and two oxygen atoms. 
okay? And so if you know the position of uh, uh, and the charges of those atoms, you can write the so-called many-body Hamiltonian, which depends only on positions and charges, and it has a kinetic energy in it and a potential energy and so on. And I'm not going into details because you had a tutorial week for the details, but you can ask me about those details if you want. And so we write this Hamiltonian operator, and then this operator acts on this thing which we call the wave function, okay? And this is nothing else but the Schrodinger equation. Now, solving this Schrodinger equation exactly is impossible for anything but the hydrogen atom uh, in, uh, in terms of nuclear electronic systems. And so in order to solve this equation for any realistic system, we have to take approximations. And the basic approximations that we take is on this object, the wave function. So in principle, it's a three n dimensional object where n is the number of electrons or in, in general quantum particles. And so instead of working in the three n dimensional space, we expand it somehow. So we do uh, an expansion in terms of orbitals, for example, with this one, one electron orbitals. And there is a wide range of methods, so-called density functional theory, which I will describe later, uh, second order perturbation theory, so-called couple cluster methods, and so on and so forth, that all they do is somehow approximate this object, okay? And so there are some coefficients in that object. You optimize those coefficients variationally, and then this gives you the solution of a Schrodinger equation, and at the end you get this energy, which is the ground state energy of the system. You can get excited state energies, and so on and so forth. Once you can do that, right, we can also not only compute energies, but we can compute properties. So some operators that act on the wave function, and this gives us access to energies, polarizability, which is the response of the system to an electric field, the orbital positions, and so on and so forth. And we can use all those properties to design molecules and materials with given functionalities. Also, often what we do is we take this molecule and we're interested in the dynamics of this molecule under some applied thermal uh, uh, or pressure conditions, so some uh, statistical ensemble. And so what we do is what we have to parameterize as a solution of this equation for all conformational degrees of freedom. So what happens if we change the configuration of the molecule, how uh, energies and forces on atoms change. And this allows us to do dynamics of the molecule so we can compute thermal properties, spectroscopic properties that we can compare to experiment. Okay, so this is what is done today in the field. This is done by thousands and tens of thousands of people in chemistry and physics. And um, the problem is that once you do this on this particular molecule and on the other particular molecule, you never typically cross correlate properties. Okay, so you do it on ethanol and you do it on aspirin, but you don't do it on both of them, right? So you don't see how a solution of a Schrodinger equation for ethanol can give you some information about aspirin or vice versa. And so that's really the idea of applying machine learning in chemical space. So now instead of doing this for one molecule, you do it for a very large data set of molecules. So you calculate a bunch of quantum mechanical properties for a very large data set of molecules. You generate training data, which are molecular properties. You put it through some black box, or maybe not such a black box. So maybe you can make it wider. Uh, and then finally, once you have this, in principle, you can ask completely different questions than what you could ask before on the last slide. You can ask questions about the structure of chemical space. You can ask questions about reactivity trends, what molecules react with what other molecules. You can ask questions that are of interest to chemists, such as how aromaticity evolves in chemical space. You can ask questions about new chemistry and so on and so forth. And if you can really close this uh, cycle, then in principle, this would allow you to do molecular design through multi-property optimization. So many talks in this, uh, uh, in this week will try to do parts of the cycle, but actually we are not there yet, okay? So we have not closed the cycle completely and we still don't know. There are many challenges on the way to really close the cycle and to enable molecular design, okay? So that's the final goal that we want to achieve. Now, of course, the first question that comes to mind, so all this hinges on the availability of data. And this data hopefully should be reliable data. But calculating reliable data with quantum mechanics is very, very, very hard, right? Because you have to solve a Schrodinger equation with increasing accuracy. And so what people do instead, as I said, is they take approximations to the solution of a Schrodinger equation. And there is a whole industry of approximations, okay? Um, so roughly represented by this diagram here. So here's my, my Schrodinger equation, which I can solve exactly by so-called full configuration interaction methods. It's a linear expansion in terms of determinants, so-called Slater determinants that obey the antisymmetric property of the wave function for electrons. And you have to do this expansion, typically you get tens of millions of terms and you have to optimize the linear coefficients of this expansion. 
So you can imagine this is a very hard thing to do, uh, okay? And so this is not done in practice. So this one can do this full CI calculations perhaps for about 10 electrons, okay? So this is not very useful. There is also uh, alternative techniques which will also be described this week, so-called quantum Monte Carlo technique. So you write an ansatz for the wave function, and in fact you can use uh, deep networks as an ansatz, um, and you can optimize the parameters in this ansatz, and you also get, in principle, you approximate the solution of the equation. And uh, with this methods, people have pushed the uh, exponential wall a bit, right? But perhaps you can do it in a foreseeable future for 20 electrons. But you still face an exponential wall, okay? The materials you want to do have millions of electrons. So there is still some uh, bridging to be done from 20 to 2 million, okay? So this is not what you do, right? Although this is very, very um, good. I mean, people have to develop those methods and they're still developing them because in the end you will need benchmarks at different scales, okay? So this is still an active area of research. Now, on the other, on completely different extreme, you have these methods, which are empirical potentials, which is what people use to do, for example, biomolecular simulation. So if you want to fold a protein, right, people typically use classical potentials that don't have any electronic degrees of freedom. They parameterize forces on atoms, right, from, uh, by fitting to experimental data or by calculations on small molecules. And they mix and match this information, typically. Um, so they're also called force fields, but the reliability of those force fields is really hard to, uh, uh, to assess, okay? So they are applicable to some systems for which they have been trained on, but it's very hard to know what they actually don't have, okay? So you really have to close your eyes and blindly trust in your result, and often it is the case that they are not really, so they are never really predictive, and they are not really reliable. Okay, so of course you, there is a lot of methods that bridge from this very simple approximations to this very sophisticated approximations uh, going through semi-empirical methods based on density functional theory on quantum chemistry. There is density functional theory which is the workhorse theory for electronic structure and I will describe it in the next couple of slides. Um, then there are approximate quantum mechanical methods, perturbation theory, couple cluster methods and so on. And so when we go up here, right, the accuracy of our calculation goes up. So we want, we want in principle to be really here, uh, which means that also predictive power increases. But unfortunately, the computational cost really increases exponentially. And the other big, big problem is that uh, as you go up and work with very complicated wave functions, you, don't, you lose all the nice conceptual insights, okay? So, for example, at this level, you, you know how your force depends on the atomic position. Here you know the information about the electron density, which is a three-dimensional object, but here you have information in some high-dimensional space, and it's really hard to understand. So it's not very unlike, uh, you know, deep networks in the sense, right? You don't really can comprehend the information that is enclosed in a many uh, electron wave function for, say, 10 electrons. Okay. But the computational cost you mentioned, is it, um, how much of this is dependent on particular kinds of hardware? So for example, in deep learning we went to CPUs and GPUs, it was a game changer for us. Right. Is, uh, here, in this context, uh, GPUs is a game changer here because these are very simple functional forms. It's not a game changer there because you, you have to do just too many different mathematics. So you have to do integrals, you have to construct matrices, you have to diagonalize them. Uh, they are typically very big matrices, they don't fit into GPU memory, and so on and so forth. So, so it's not a big game changer really uh, here. Unless, of course, you do quantum Monte Carlo with deep networks, then GPUs uh, can, can help you, but they can help you only up to a very low number of, of lectures. Okay, so this slide actually comes from Matthias Rupp, who is in the audience. So um, that really illustrates the, the big issue, okay? So the big issue with quantum mechanics is that you have collective states. And I roughly actually showed what, what the collective state means here. So this is a molecule. In fact, there are two molecules. There's a fullerene, which is a so-called buckyball. And there is a, a complex which encloses this buckyball. And this shows actually a real calculation, so uh, a quantum state, right, uh, of, um, of a molecule that emerges because this molecule interacts with that one. Okay, and this is just one quantum state. There is really many, many of them. And you have to solve for this quantum state and each one of those quantum states which have some eigenvalue, some energy. Okay? And you have to occupy those eigenvalues with certain probabilities dictated by the Schrodinger equation. And this would give you the solution of the Schrodinger equation. Okay? So this kind of pictorial illustrates the complexity of solving the Schrodinger equation. 
But um, the issue is, as I said, right, when you, as, as you go from these force fields, molecular mechanics, to a configuration interaction, as you see, your runtime increases quite quickly, okay? So at the level of so-called gold standard of quantum mechanics, which is so-called CCSD parentheses T level, which includes single electronic excitation, double electronic excitation, perturbative triple electronic excitations, you, uh, your cost increases n to the seventh power. Okay, and n roughly is the number of electrons. Okay, so if you double your system size, you have to do two orders of magnitude more computational time, which is clearly not uh, uh, achievable. And in fact, again, density functional theory here stands out as uh, a workhorse method because you can apply density functional theory today for systems with thousands of atoms. Okay, so this really makes you um, uh, go to very interesting systems. And in fact, if you look at uh, approximations to density functional theory, such as generalized gradient approximation, which is widely used, it's been cited by around 100,000 times. So this just illustrates the usefulness of developing electronic structure approximations, okay? which can be really feasibly applicable to large molecules and materials. So what density functional theory does is basically uh, is based on a very simple idea. So in a Schrodinger equation, you have this object, the many electron wave function, which is three n-dimensional object, right? So this coordinates basically uh, enumerate the electronic degrees of freedom. So each one of this is a three-dimensional vector. Uh, and instead of using this object, you say, well, why don't I use this much simpler object, which is basically the integral of the square of the wave function integrated over all electronic coordinates. So instead of a 3n dimensional object, you go to a 3 dimensional object. And this is where the Nobel Prize, so this is proven by the hohenberg horn theorem, right? It's proven that if you want ground state energies, right, then you can course grain from this function to that function, and in principle, you don't lose any information. But it's only in principle, okay? In practice, what it means is that by coarse graining from here to there, what you have to do is to recover all the quantum mechanical effects as functionals of the electron density. And these functionals can, can, in principle, be extremely non-local functional. So a density over here should know about the density 50 nanometers away. Okay? And this is a very long spatial scale. And no one tells you how localized or delocalized this functional should be. Right? There's absolutely no knowledge about that for real nuclear electronic systems. There is knowledge about that for model systems, and all functionals that we use are based on model systems. So you start with a homogeneous electron gas. You say that all the density is homogeneous, and this gives uh, rise to so-called LDA approximation, the local density approximation. The approximation is mostly used today, so-called PBE. This is a gradient-corrected uh, functional, so it knows about the local electron density and the gradient. Okay, So it's only semi-local information, and this uh, PBE uh, stands for Purdue, Burke, Erzenhoff. This is a citation I had on my last slide. And today, people are developing increasingly more non-local functionals using, for example, the secondary, which is sort of the Laplacian of the density or the local kinetic energy density. But all of these approximations, right, are still approximations. So, so density functional theory is exact, but density functional approximations, DFA, are not exact, okay? And you don't really know what you lose by uh, making such a local or semi-local approximation to the uh, quantum mechanical exchange and correlation effects. And in particular, in the context of my talk, in context of going to larger systems, a big problem that all those functionals have is that they lack long range quantum electronic correlation. So electrons, they are objects which fluctuate, right? They are not classical, they're quantum mechanical. So it means that they interact with the vacuum field. So they fluctuate and these fluctuations correlate with each other. And the correlations can go to very large distances. And so in particular, because of this lack of long range correlations, there are no so-called van der Waals interactions in those functionals. And the van der Waals interaction is something of a purely quantum mechanical effect, which can be easily understood if you have two atoms and you separate them in distance. The interaction between these two atoms has to decay algebraically. And in functionals, such as those ones, they, the interaction decays exponentially. So that's a very simple uh, scale. Okay, so um, because of that, right, uh, using dense functional theory is actually insufficient uh, when uh, we talk about molecules and materials, and we have to do something else. And what we have done uh, over many years is propose uh, extension of dense functional theory, so-called DFT plus many biodispersion method, where we add this missing long-range electronic correlations. 
And so this is also illustrates how we do progress in physics, right? So we try to understand what is missing. Uh, and we want to, uh, we know that what is missing is very hard to model. And so we have to come up with model systems that allow us to model this missing part. And so what we do is basically propose uh, a model system which instead of electrons, which instead of modeling electronic degrees of freedom, models oscillator degrees of freedom. So oscillators is what uh, physicists love very much because you can handle them easily and you understand a lot about oscillators. And so if you found an effective projection of electrons to oscillators, uh, parameterized through a density of the electrons, you can then solve an auxiliary system of oscillators exactly quantum mechanics mechanically and you can add the long range electron correlation energy to your given semi-local density function. So this is what is done uh, you know, from 2009 to 2014. We have developed a range of methods which is now one single method called MVD which you add to density functional theory and then you have a method which treats semi-local effects at the density functional theory level plus non-local electronic correlation effects uh, for the system of oscillators and this gives you uh, a general method that you can use to calculate real molecules and materials. Now it is still an approximate method, okay? It's not exact, but nevertheless it has all the ingredients that the uh, electronic exchange and correlation should have. What is the computational scaling of the MP? It's n cubed, so it involves a matrix diagonalization, which is exactly the same as uh, DFT, but the matrix you have to diagonalize is different matrix. It's not matrix of electronic interactions, it's a matrix of oscillator interactions. Right? But these oscillators are parameterized through the density, so you basically you still have a density functional, but there are two parts in it. One is electronic, another one is the oscillator function. And then you couple them together. Okay, so now we have at least the method that is uh, feasibly applicable to thousands of atoms, okay? But it still scales cubically, okay? But this gives you the ability to produce data. Now, the question is, of course, um, um, if you want to apply machine learning model now uh, to real molecules and materials, we have to generate this quantum mechanical data. Uh, but first, before we generate the data and apply machine learning methods, we have to understand about the spatial and temporal scales of our interactions, right? Because this will dictate how we actually come up with representations of interactions in molecules and materials. Uh, and so, um, for this reason, I want to give three slides that sort of try to infer, right, so to get insight from these uh, wave functions that we compute, how far away can interactions actually propagate. And this will also tell you how far away you have to design your representations, right, in order to capture all of those interactions in real machine learning models. So I will give three examples of the, which will all concentrate on ranges of interactions in real molecules and materials of uh, relevance to uh, nanotechnology and biology. And I will start with one example at the nanoscale. So uh, what I'm showing here is the interaction power law. So this is the so-called van der Waals power law, but really it's the power law of the interaction. So you have two objects, for example, a biomolecule, which is a biomolecule we all have in our cells, right? It's a large object with 4,000 atoms, and it interacts with a wire. It's a carbine wire, so it's a nano object, okay? And we separate these two objects by a certain distance, and we measure the distance as the distance between centers of mass of these two objects, and we ask the question, what is the power law for the interaction? Uh, so density functional theory, if you up, can apply this to the system, would give you a power law that exponentially goes uh, down because density functional theory has no interactions as the density uh, overlap between two objects fades away and this fades away exponentially. Okay, so it has a completely wrong uh, decay. If you go to the textbook, a textbook tells you that to compute interactions you just need to take all atoms on this um, on this uh, protein, all atoms of this wire, and just sum in a pairwise fashion. So you sum over all pairs of atoms, and this should give you an interaction power law. And this gives you this boring power law here, d to the minus 5, because the interactions between atoms, the pairwise interactions, decay as distance to the minus 6. So you integrate over one dimension. This y is actually periodic, so, so it's a one-dimensional integral, and you get d to the minus 5 interaction. 
So this is lo looks very boring, right? So you now ask the question of what happens if I do the full quantum mechanics. So I write a Hamiltonian where all these atoms interact with all those atoms. I diagonalize this Hamiltonian and I compute the interaction energy. And then you get this power law exponent here, this green curve. Okay? And what you see is that this green curve is much more interesting than that one. And in fact, the interaction propagates to much, much larger distances than what is um, um, textbook picture gives you. Okay? Uh, and this interaction can be as large as d to the minus 3 at separations of about uh, 8 nanometers, which is a very large separation, uh, which is significantly larger than the extent of this object. And, and this interaction is so uh, interesting and scalable because what happens is that there are quantum fluctuations on this molecule, on that molecule, and these quantum fluctuations ac actually have larger uh, spatial extent than the size of the system. Okay? And so basically you interfere with the vacuum state, if you wish, and this creates a very non-trivial scalable interaction power. Um, and the range, the spatial extent of this interaction can go up to 20, 30 nanometers, which is uh, a very large uh, uh, interaction range. Um, things get even more interesting when you include more physics and you go to larger systems. So this is an example of a system, of a, again, an interacting system at the mesoscale. So we really have a mesoscopic um, um, a gold cone or, or a surface, a gold surface, and we again have this nanowire on the surface and we are bending this nanowire and we are computing the interaction energy as a function of the bending angle of this nanowire with the surface. And here we have an additional degree of freedom because we have this large system, the uh, interaction propagates at the speed of light. And typically in quantum calculations, we neglect the speed of light. Well, actually we make it infinite, right? So the interaction is instantaneous, but actually it's not. It has to be uh, Lorentz invariant, so fully relativistic. And we can include relativity as well in our calculations. And what we see is that if you do a relativistic calculation or a non-relativistic calculation, the um, a profile, the energy profile of the interaction changes qualitatively. And so um, this example just serves to say that if you neglect the right physics, right, and you try to machine learn the non-relativistic energy profile, well, you can machine learn it, but it will be completely wrong, okay? So you really have to think about the physics of the problem in order to uh, understand what uh, your reference data contains or what it does not contain in terms of scale and system size. Um, there's a lot of interest, for example, now of learning a machine, uh, of doing machine learning models for small molecules. And then people say, well, you can actually extrapolate to any system size because my, 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 my model is scalable. It's scalable, but it, if it doesn't have these interactions, you will get the wrong result if you scale it. Okay. So the final example I want to give is something which is not uh, our own work, but an experimental work, which is still unexplained, which sort of hints that there are such long-range quantum mechanical effects even at macroscopic scale. So it, objects of astronomical significance. Okay, so, um, um, so this is a very nice story which is, uh, was initiated by this paper, but actually there are about five or ten papers after that that try to analyze the data. And so what people do is um, they look at this uh, uh, so-called rubble pile asteroids in space, and these are um, basically soft objects, so it's organic matter, which grows uh, around rocks. So it's a semi-hard, semi-soft object, but overall it's quite soft. And the surprise that they had is that when you do these astronomical observations, you measure the torque, so the rotational acceleration of the object. And the rotational acceleration is very high. And this was a surprise because it's a soft object. And so something in the object provides the necessary cohesion for this large rotational acceleration, which people observe. And so people then try to come up with models for cohesion within the asteroid. And so basically you start with the classical model. There is self-gravity, right, of this asteroid. You know its density, you know its mass, so you can construct models for its self-gravity. You can construct models for friction between grains. You can put electrostatics and so on and so forth. And what they found is that independently of what classical model they came up with, it was not able to explain the internal cohesion. So there was about 50% of the interaction missing somewhere. So there is uh, apparently a non-classical effect, um, and of course if it's non-classical it's probably quantum mechanical, at least what, that's what they say uh, uh, in the papers, uh, which still uh, basically tells that our knowledge of quantum mechanical interactions uh, or 
cohesive interactions in large object is, is really only uh, uh, starting to emerge. Okay? Um, so these were just three examples that uh, try to um, um, tell you a story about uh, how um, uh, quantum mechanical interactions interplay with land scales in different materials. And there's a lot of interest in physics that is still unknown in terms of uh, scale involves of these interactions. Now, I would like to step for a moment from this astronomical object to real uh, molecules and materials and to give you an example of what actually can be done with state-of-the-art quantum mechanics in terms of addressing properties and functionalities of real materials. Um, and I will do that uh, on, the, on a very realistic and important example of molecular crystals. Um, so molecular crystals uh, is something that is used everywhere, right? Uh, drugs are molecular crystals, explosives are molecular crystals, um, materials for organic electronics are molecular crystals. So whenever you come with some uh, molecule which is interesting, you typically have to pack it in a crystalline state in order to use that, right? So. Uh, in this context of molecular crystal, the problem that you want to solve is you're given a molecule and you need to crystallize it in uh, a structure which is functional. But it turns out that molecules like to crystallize in a wide range of different structures, right? And it's really hard to make a molecule crystallize in a structure that you want, okay? So this problem is called the polymorphism problem. And predicting polymorphism of molecular crystals is a very general and a very challenging problem uh, in both of those experiment and theory. The interesting thing is, if you have a molecule like this, which is very flexible, you can in fact come out with about 10,000 polymorphs within an energy window, which is uh, interesting. Okay, and so how do you distinguish them? How do you um, um, rationalize the appearance of all those different structures? Um, the, the other problem is that the, so these, these molecules in the crystal are held by intermolecular interactions. There are different kinds of intermolecular interactions uh, among which van der Waals plays a big role, but it's not the only interaction. There's electrostatics, polarization, uh, Pauli repulsion. Um, and the energy difference between those polymorphs is often very, very small. So in, uh, for chemists in the audience, on the order of one to four kilojoule per mole, which is a very, very, very small energy. It's about one or two percent of the total lattice energy of the crystal. Now, interestingly, although the energies can be very similar, but the other chemical and physical properties are completely different. So one uh, crystal can be a functional drug. Another crystal, the same molecule, is, doesn't function at all. You swallow it, it doesn't dissolve. Right? So it's not a drug. Right? So that's why predicting those crystal structures is a very important problem. And uh, um, something that is done in the field is actually uh, something very interesting where our field also progresses is to do blind test of crystal structure prediction. So, uh, and it's something interesting because there is no way to cheat. So often, right, you do a calculation and you do a calculation on data that is available experimentally. So you already know the result. And if your calculation is wrong, well, you change your calculation method to reproduce experiment, right? This is often done by, by many people in many different fields. And so this test is, avoids that problem, okay? So what uh, they do at Cambridge uh, Crystallographic Data Center is that they ask actively different experimental groups to submit crystal structures. Uh, they uh, have to make sure that these are trustable, trustworthy results. So they ask different groups to submit. Uh, then they select those uh, molecules that are have, that have reliable crystalline structures, uh, and then they release the two-dimensional formulas of molecules in the crystal to the uh, community. And any theory group or experimental group, if they do theoretical calculations, can participate to predict the possible polymorphs of those molecules. Okay. And so the, the only information you get is this molecular structure. You don't get any information about the conformation. You don't get any information about the crystal structure. And you have to predict crystal structures and submit them. Okay, so really in a blind fashion. And uh, uh, this was the last blind test in 2016, where, uh, which was very challenging. So there were five different molecules. And even the rigid molecule, which is very strange because it has no hydrogen atoms. So it, it meant actually that it can deform. 
there was a real drug from Pfizer which failed in the, la in the last test of, uh, uh, um, uh, of uh, drug availability. So they released all the information. They had five polymorphs characterized experimentally. That was a salt, that was this co-crystal, and a very flexible molecule. And so um, uh, just to show how uh, difficult this problem is, here are the success rates. So there were 27 groups that participated in this blind test. And the success here is, is, is uh, um, defined in a very loose way. So basically, as a, as a group that does polymorph prediction, you are allowed to submit a list of 100 structures that you generated, ordered by the energy. So that would be the global minimum, the second uh, lowest minimum, and so on and so forth. And if you got the experimental structure within this list of 100 structures, it would be success. This is not a real success, right? You really have to get the experimental structures number one. Okay, so the definition of success was, you know, allowed for a lot of cheating, I would say. But even with that definition of success, you see that the success rate is not very high. Okay, so even this molecule, which was simple, 57% uh, of people could predict it within the 100 structures. But as you go to more flexible molecules, the success rate decays uh, very quickly. So this is uh, what we did, right? We used DFT plus MBD, as I said, uh, uh, to this problem. But there is, of course, uh, an additional component here because in order to do calculations, we have to get the structure somehow. And we partnered with the group of Markus Neumann, uh, who actually runs uh, a consulting company that works with Big Pharma on uh, crystal structure prediction. So he has a tailor-made force field that he has created over 15 years by working with a lot of pharma companies. It's a force field that is coarse-grained to some first principles, DFT calculations, plus experimental data, and he produces a bunch of structures. But their energies are not very reliable. So he gives us a list of structures, 500 structures for each molecule. We then rank those structures with the best method we can, which is DFT plus many by dispersion. We compute their not only lattice energy, but free energy in the harmonic approximation. And then we get this uh, polymorphic landscape. Right? So we get 500 structures ordered in terms of the energy. So to show what we got, here are the overlays. So again, this is completely blind. Okay? So we got only the molecule, we predicted crystal structures, and then we submitted them to the, to the Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center, and they did this analysis. So, so these are overlays of the structures that we had predicted blindly to the experimental uh, uh, structures. The experimental structures are in gray, our structures are colored, and there's absolutely no difference. Okay, there are very slight differences for the most flexible molecules, but the root mean square deviation for 20 molecules in the supercell is 0.1 angstrom, which is tiny. Right? It's order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude smaller than what people do in the, in the uh, protein folding community. Okay? It's extremely small difference. Um, now, of course, these are just structures, okay? So they took the structure with the same space group that uh, the experiment had and compared. Of course, now what about the energies, right? Our, our, our energy is actually predicted. So here is the energy profile, right, for four out of the five molecules. So what I'm showing you here is all the energies for the 500 structures cutting off at some high energy, right? And the experimental structure is the red one here, okay? And here, what we, what we show is what happens as you increase the level of theory. So these calculations are less expensive. These calculations are more expensive, but can still be done. And so as you increase the level of theory, the experimental structure becomes number one, so the global minimum on all our energy landscapes, okay? which means that we can correctly predict the experimental structure as the global minimum on our landscape. So we are truly predictive. And in fact, for the fizz molecule, which I'm not showing you here, which is the real drug molecule, we predicted all the experimental structures uh, within energy of thermal fluctuations, plus we found the new structure, which was not seen by experiment, which is much more stable than all the experimental structures, and we believe this is a new prediction, and experimentalists now have to crystallize it, but it's very, very hard to crystallize a structure uh, which was not seen uh, normally in experiment. So this demonstrates um, um, the um, advances that, that we have, the state-of-the-art quantum mechanical methods, uh, but there is a huge problem, okay? So these calculations take a very long time, not only computer time, but also PhD student time, okay? So Johannes, who, who did this project, spent about two years of his PhD on this. 
Um, there was a lot of things to develop, so it's not just doing calculations, it's, there's a lot of development, but also this took quite a long time on, on supercomputers. So uh, the total amount of time which went into this is about 20 million CPU hours, okay? Um, this is fine to do once, but you don't want it to do for every new molecule, okay? And so that's where the challenge really is. So how can we leverage all this data that we have um, and how we can produce sufficient data to actually then use machine learning to sidestep all of this expensive calculation? And we know that this is possible just looking at the data, but this has not been yet done, right? So that's where the frontier is. So the red is the experiment also? Or so the red is what the experimental structure is. Okay? okay, so that's the experimental structure. Uh -huh. And the best outcome that you can expect is that theory predicts this as a global minimum on your potential energy landscape. So how do you explain the, the as you go to deeper theory from TS to MVD, you get in the second and third structures, it's not as good a green as right? right, because all, all, the, all the ingredients matter, <coughs> right? So if you include all the ingredients, in the end, it becomes the global minimum on the, on the potential energy surface. I Right, so at any given level of theory, you can jump up and down, but if you include all the contributions, right, so you do many by dispersion, you go to a hybrid functional which improves power repulsion, you add free energy, uh, all this basically gives you the, the right uh, ranking. Do you know about the next positions in the ranking? Are they also the correct ones? Um, well, experimentally, uh, so what we know is for the fifth system, which I don't show here because it's a big mess, but it doesn't matter because all the five experimental structures are within thermal fluctuations. So they're indistinguishable, right? And that's what the experiment actually sees. They get them randomly depending on what they start with, right? So it's also the right prediction that we have, okay? So it's really, so it's very hard to crystallize a given structure. This is an unsolved experimental challenge, how, how to do this, what conditions you have to do, because you have to, you have to create the right critical nucleus. It's a very, very hard problem, nucleation problem. It's an, it's an unsolved problem. This work was done after the blind challenge, though. So this was the sort of classic, like you knew the result when you were working on this, or is this result from being in the challenge? So, so this is uh, this is an improved result. So there was a paper published, uh, this paper, um, which presents the result of the blind, completely blind calculations, and it was almost as good as what I've shown. Okay, so this paper presents the result after the test. Right, where we had the time to analyze things because we could also analyze why certain things didn't work, right? And it was not the energy prediction that didn't work. There was uh, one structure that was missing from the force field prediction, but the energy prediction was as good when we did it blindly as well. Are they going to run another one of these soon? Hmm? Are they going to run? Is, are they, gonna run? They, they want to do it. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, yes, it's, it's really hard to get uh, uh, good experimental structures for these flexible molecules. And in fact, we have more and more examples where uh, experiment misses structures. So in a sense, our best theory is more predictive on terms of the landscape than the experimental structures. Well, that's that they your calculation is correct. Right. Well, we have this, <laughs> so we have this results not only for these five molecules, we have them by now for 20 different molecules. And, um, and in about 30% of the cases, we predict new structures which have lower in energy, and some of those structures have been synthesized after the theoretical prediction. Um, and so this seems to be a general case for these flexible molecules that the landscape actually is so difficult uh, um, that often uh, the experiment crystallizes to a structure which lives in a, in a wide well, but there is a lot of the global minimum that, that have much more narrow wells, and so it's really hard to get the experiment. Okay. That's our current understanding. Okay, so um, any more questions? May I go to machine learning? I got one quick question about the hybrid function. So, is there no use for like the carbon cluster, like higher order approximations for this problem? What's wrong with the many body? And like, did I keep that for all right all along? Yeah, so the hybrid functional gives you a very good results for the uh, electrostatics, polarization, powder repulsion. Um, at least that's an empirical finding. There is, of course, scope to always go to a higher level theory. 
Um, and it would be nice if someone goes there. But for these molecules, I just don't see that this is feasible uh, in a foreseeable future. And in the end, uh, the accuracy that uh, um, the pharma wants is about two kilojoules per mole per molecule, and via that. So talking to pharma, I mean, they will always do experiments, right? There's no way to, to avoid doing experiments. But what they want to know is that the, there are no more, uh, 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 more stable structures than what they get in experiment, because that could be a potential disaster, right? Because more stable structures are less soluble, so the drug stops functioning. Right? And so all they want to know is the structure they found experimentally, which works, is global energy medium. Right? That's, that's all they want to know. That's why we need machine learning. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, so I'm coming to machine learning. Okay. So, so I hope I've convinced you that we understand a lot about quantum mechanics. We can also use quantum mechanics for real systems uh, to get to, to study real materials. And then the question is, uh, um, how can we leverage machine learning to really enable uh, finally this question of multi-property design through chemical space? Um, and so first, of course, you have to understand what chemical space is, in particular, how quantum properties evolve in chemical space. Uh, and so roughly, uh, we don't actually, so we don't have a mathematical definition of chemical space. Uh, I think it's still an open challenge to, to, to do a deeper analysis of what chemical space is, how properties evolve, what are the nonlinear uh, features that, 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 uh, that emerge in chemical space, and how do you actually do design. But roughly, right, in a sort of quantum perspective, we can um, um, represent chemical space in this simple picture, right? You have some nonlinear function, you have molecular structures, and they map to, to, to properties. And so basically, you can do this map of positions and charges to uh, a vector of properties, okay? And these properties, of course, in principle, uh, all the properties are encoded in a wave function. So in principle, you can map this to a wave function, but this is not a very useful mapping because you don't want to design in a wave function space, okay? Uh, through the Hohenberg-Kohn theorem, we know that the density itself is sufficient to represent molecules. So in principle, we could take the density as a vector of properties, right? Or basically compute multiple moments of the density which then can reconstruct the full density. And so this would still be a unique mapping. Okay? But in, in any real uh, application of molecular design, we're actually interested in a, in a wide range of properties, and we want to constrain how much information we put in this vector. We cannot compute too many properties with quantum mechanics. So for example, we want to use some structural information, but we also want to use the polarizability, the uh, uh, dipole moment of a molecule, and so on and so forth. And so uh, there's always a particular, depending on the particular application, you, 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 you make this map different. And so in fact, you cannot even assure that this is a, a, a bijective map, okay? And in, in fact, for many applications, you don't care that it's not a bijective map because you want to set an interval of the values of the different properties and you want to find all molecules that satisfy that criteria. So it doesn't have to be really bijective, okay? Although it would be nice if it's bijective because you can prove things and so on, right? <laughs> Um, and so we know that there is a lot of molecules. You can generate them with graph theory, roughly. There is a combinatorial explosion. And of course, finding molecules with given set of properties is, uh, is a difficult problem. Um, and so we started this actually here in 2011 uh, at IPEN, asking this question uh, on the program which was organized by Anatol von Lindelfeld. Uh, and so immediately when you try to construct a nonlinear model of chemical space, you face a lot of questions, right? How you describe a molecule, it's not trivial because this is not a good descriptor because it's not translation and rotation and permutation invariant. Right? So you want most molecular properties are, if you translate a molecule, or rotate a molecule, or permute the same atoms with the same charge, properties don't change, right? So this is the basic requirement of a descriptor. Also, how do you define a metric in this descriptor space? How you select the data, uh, which is more valuable for your model? And uh, what set of properties do you actually compute? Because each computation costs time, right? Each property will cost some time to compute. And what degrees of freedom do you actually include in your, in your machine learning? Um, so, uh, in, the, in, in the next five slides or so, I want to then show our results on several data sets. So, different models on different data sets. 
Um, uh, we started with this data set of uh, GDB, uh, which was actually presented here at IPAM by Jean-Louis uh, Jean Rimaud <laughs> from the University of Bern, which basically gives uh, a set of drug-like molecules, small drug-like molecules, um, um, and just their, their graph structures, right? their smile, so-called smile strings. Uh, we then uh, basically took a subset of the data set, so-called QM7 and QM9 data sets, and computed quantum mechanical properties uh, for these molecules. And then we've, we've also taken some of the molecules, few of them, and actually ran molecular dynamics trajectories uh, with density functional theory, and then computed forces with gold standard couple cluster level of theory. And all of this data is now available on the side, and we're actually updating uh, the data as we generate it as well. Um, now, if you want to apply machine learning to physics and chemistry, you have to define a baseline. And machine learning baselines are not very good baselines. So a mean predictor is not a good baseline, or a k-means predictor is not a good baseline, because for physical and chemical systems, you actually understand a lot of physics and chemistry. So you can come up with good baselines, which should define the, the, the lower limit of of, of the accuracy that your machine learning should achieve. And we did this analysis in this, in this, in this paper, actually, with Katja Hansen, who, who was a PhD student of Klaus Müller, and, and she actually was here at IPAM in 2011, so she came to my group as a postdoc. And we, we tried to construct a series of this hierarchy of approximations, increasing complexity of the description, and hopefully the accuracy would also improve as we do that. And we started with extremely naive models, okay? Uh, and we were very surprised because these extremely naive models actually achieved the accuracy, which was very similar to the best machine learning, nonlinear machine learning methods, which were available at that point in 2013, 2014. So um, we realized that we had to redefine completely the baselines because simple models that know nothing about the chemistry give you accuracy, which was comparable to the best machine learning. Okay, which is clearly uh, you know a big surprise. But we also realized that if you include more and more physics in the representation of a molecule, you then can go and achieve actually state-of-the-art performance when you mix in physical information in the descriptor of your molecule with the nonlinearity or the flexibility that machine learning, nonlinear machine learning models give. Um, just to illustrate this, so that's uh, so that's where we started. So we took this QM9 data set. Uh, uh, which contains 131,000 molecules. And uh, I'm showing you here the evolution of prediction power of the different models as a number of training samples. And this is the mean absolute error in k cal per mole. So this is what we had with a descriptor that we proposed in 2011 here at IPAM, so-called uh, uh, sorted Coulomb matrix descriptor. Uh, you can see that the offset was huge, right? So you start from 30 k cal per mole error, which is awful. But then it actually learns very, very slowly, okay? And so if you use 10,000 molecules, you get to about um, 10 kcal per mole. And then what you do is you just put more physics in the descriptor. This is 2015, so-called bag of bonds descriptor. Uh, this is uh, a descriptor that has two body features and different polynomial potentials between atoms. And this is 2018, where you include also three body information, so information about interactions between three atoms in the molecule. And as you see, so you don't put any more, um, um, so your machine learning doesn't change. You use the same machine learning, in this case, kernel ridge regression uh, for each descriptor. And you're changing the physics and the descriptor, and your prediction goes from here to there. Are all these descriptors invariant to rotations, rotations, and permutations? No, some mostly, yeah. Right. Um, so the. Yeah, I mean, in this case, the sorted Coulomb matrix also is permutationally invariant. So yeah, so they both they all satisfy. Uh, I guess that's not true, no? The the Bob. Um, no, the Bob is permutationally invariant because you do the uh, uh, the ordering in the right way. Yeah. So they all they all have uh, a translational, rotational, permutation invariance. Yeah. Uh, but the, but these descriptors also include additional information that we know about interactions between atoms and molecules. Okay, uh, but what you can see is so you improved 80-fold, right, by just putting more physics in your model. But the nonlinear um, um, the nonlinearity of the machine learning still helps. If you do a linear model, your prediction is uh, um, 
uh, is varies by a factor of three or so, right? So the nonlinearity is important, uh, but the most important aspect is the physics. And also defining the baseline, okay? So what do you compare to? And the baseline here should be around 10 kcal per mole. If you are um, um, up, if your error is larger than 10 kcal per mole, you can come up with an extremely simple physical model with five parameters that, that has that, that performance, okay? Um, so, so all those, those two things are very important in any application of machine learning, okay? First, define the baseline, which should come from a physical method, not the method which is convenient for your machine learning method. And then also think about the, um, um, the physics that you're putting in, in, your, in your representation. Now, uh, from um, um, the time we did our work, and also actually prior to our work, there were other uh, descriptors proposed. So now, really, we have a zoo of descriptors. And in fact, based on our data, I think every couple of weeks, there is a new uh, descriptor representation being proposed. Okay? And, and the state of the art keeps improving very slowly. But, um, uh, but that's actually an issue, right? Because you cannot control that zoo uh, and uh, you don't know what the limit is. It's hard to prove anything. And so uh, because of this problem of the zoo of descriptors in uh, 2017, uh, we asked Christoph um, to actually try to come up with a general architecture. In this case, he liked deep neural networks. Um, that would actually generalize all of those descriptors. Uh, embedded in an architecture of the network. And so the idea he came up with, which was really excited, uh, actually turns out to be inspired by quantum mechanics. Okay, so he said it was inspired by something else, but when he presented me the architecture, it was clearly that our discussions about quantum mechanics really inspired him to come up with this architecture. And so I will not describe this uh, very much, but I will just to say, so basically what we say is that every atom lives in a high dimensional space. And you don't know what this high dimensional space is, you want to figure this out. And you figure this out from interactions between atoms. So basically at zero's order, every atom is a high dimensional embedding. Then you add interactions, and these interactions are modeled as tensor contractions, okay? And this, and this tensors live in this uh, product uh, space between these uh, atomic embeddings. Then you learn the parameters of those tensor embeddings. You do it in a recursive way. Right? Uh, and finally, at the end, you basically learn the embedding of every atom in that high dimensional space. And that embedding will depend with the interactions that the atom has with all the other atoms in the moon. Okay? Because it's a tensor uh, decomposition and because um, it's a recursive method, of course, the, uh, you can learn a very high dimensional and uh, very nonlinear embed. And in fact, the error that this uh, architecture, DTNN, or the final version of it, which is called Schnett, uh, through, uh, because Christoph Schutt, right? Um, uh, the mean absolute error on this QM9 data set is 0.2 kcal per mole, which is much lower than all the kernel methods that I have described so far. But of course, there is a price to pay here because uh, you need a lot of data to achieve this, this accuracy. So this, uh, this 0.2 kcal per mole accuracy, right, which is much better than the best uh, accuracy which we had here, right, this is about 1 kcal per mole. Uh, is achieved on using 80% of the data in the, uh, in the QM9 data set, okay? If you use about 20% of the data, you would get something like 1k cal per mole as well, which is comparable to kernel methods. Okay, but interestingly, right, of course, once you have such a very high dimensional and non-trivial architecture, you can actually ask the question of what did it learn? Does it, did it learn some quantum mechanics? And in fact, it does, okay? So what you can do with this architecture, you can actually probe it. Like this is what we do in physics, right? Whenever we have an object, we want to probe it with electric fields or other atoms, right? And so in this case, we are probing what the architecture has learned with another atom. So we add an additional atom in the architecture. That atom doesn't influence all the other atoms, but it just probes them. And so then what you do is you scan this uh, um, 
any given molecule with another atom. Uh, and you do this on the so-called van der Waals sphere, so you form an isosurface. And you look at how the energy of that probe atom changes as you scan over the uh, sphere of the molecule. And what you realize is that the, the model has learned something that looks very similar to what an electrostatic potential of a molecule would look like. So if you scan with an electron over, uh, uh, over the molecule. Of course, we are not scanning with an electron. We are scanning with another atom. But in fact, this embeddings looked very much like quantum mechanics. Okay? And of course, what I want to make a point is that if you had an infinite data, right, the network can only learn the exact solution of a Schrodinger equation. Because it's a unique, there's a unique solution from the Hamiltonian to the, uh, to the energy. But of course, we are not operating with infinite data sets, and so it learns some effective representation within the data set that, that we've given. It. Okay? But it does learn quantum mechanical features, which is a nice feature of this model. OK, um, so um, let me state more challenges now. So, um, so this model is very nice. And, yeah. So if you look back at, at that, do you, are there any things that stand out as like, oh, well, here's an error we should look at it more? Like, can, you use, can you use this to then say, like, should I be looking at this class of molecules more? Or do you, are you able to ask those sorts of questions? Right, so those questions you, you can ask by looking at the distribution of the error compared to the reference data. And actually, that's a very interesting task because when you look at the molecules that have the largest error, these are very strained molecules, very weird molecules from an organic chemistry perspective. And so actually, it might mean that these are not representative molecules, but it also might mean that your reference calculation is completely wrong because you use an approximation to quantum mechanics. And if you use the much better approximation to the, to the quantum mechanics, it might actually actually be that the prediction of the model is closer to the exact result because it's smooth. Right? So there are very many interesting questions that come, come out when you really look at this whole chemical space from a statistical uh, perspective with a machine learning model. You, you mentioned that that has its embedding and that the embedding, uh, what was the defining property of the embedding? What kind of loss is used to train this embedding? So the loss, uh, you just use the loss on the property. Right, which in this case is, is the energy of the molecule. Right? So the That's your loss is function. Space you've chosen. No. So the embedding is just some high dimensional space. And in fact, that's exactly what we do in quantum mechanics as well. When we solve our on the Schrodinger equation, we propose an expansion. So each atom is expanded uh, in a basis set, right? And the number of atoms determines how many basis functions we have. And then we do the integrals and we solve the, uh, the uh, we diagonalize the Hamiltonian and so on. So uh, instead of doing that, we now just do have a very nonlinear. Uh, embedding that is learned, right? And the tensor interactions between different atoms are just learned as parametric. Are uh, two, two, two atoms or molecules with similar properties encouraged to be, sim uh, to be close in the embedding space? Right, right, right. So there's yeah. some metric you're defining over, you have K properties of, and you have some sort of metric of similarity? Not really, no. So we don't, no. So the, the only thing we have in the loss function is, is optimizing the loss on predicted energy, molecular energy, versus the training data. Right, so so we learn so we learn a very coarse grain. Right? So loss function is in a very coarse grain property, and then we learn the the this high dimensional embedding, and then we probe the high dimensional embedding, and we demonstrate that it actually has some relevance to quantum mechanics. Oh, I see. Okay, so the okay. right, right, but but there's no there's absolutely no reason why it should be quantum mechanical. It could be you know very strange, but but it, it has some quantum mechanics. In it. That's 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 the message. I'm just curious. Like what is the effective dimension? Of, so basically, it's fine if, if it runs a basis, right? Um, right. So is there any feeling of what's the number of basis functions? Yeah, yeah. So, so we've. Yeah. Space of right, right. So, so we didn't look at the dimension of the space of molecules. We looked at the dimension of the embedding, right, of every atom. And, and in that case, the, the value that we had is you know, about 50 dimensions uh, for each atom. Right. So, uh, but but again, we have hundred thousand molecules, right, and fifty dimensions. It's it's a big space. So, like effective dimensions are used. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what you need to use if you want to get this prediction accuracy, basically, right? If you if you go to forty, your prediction degrades. So that's the only thing that you observe empirically, right? So it's a very empirical observation, but uh, nevertheless 
helpful to at least define the rough dimensionality. And I mean, if you think of basis set expansions in, in quantum chemistry, uh, basically you use very similar dimensionality. So you would put perhaps 40, 50 basis functions per atom to get uh, an accurate result. Okay. Hmm? Can you wrap up? Sure, sure, good. Right, so um, I think I will skip the last part, which I wanted to talk about molecular dynamics. Um, maybe just mention that, so in completely different application, right? So I've presented how we can use machine learning to understand evolution of properties in chemical space, but we can also use machine learning to actually uh, do molecular dynamics of a single molecule, okay? And um, it's also a very helpful thing to do, and actually at the moment, uh, using machine learning uh, in so-called gradient domain machine learning, we can actually do molecular dynamics simulations of a single molecule at the essentially exact quantum mechanical level of theory, so couple cluster, the single, double, and triple excitations, and we can also treat uh, electrons and nuclei quantum mechanically, and that, of course, leads us, it's a completely paradigm shift because this was not possible to do before, uh, but I will just leave you with this reference here. So, um, Finally, um, to summarize, uh, so I hope I've illustrated the progress we've achieved. So I've explained to you um, what we understand and what we don't understand about quantum mechanics, uh, what is you know, chemical space, how we can roughly define it, and how machine learning can be helpful to um, basically achieve a statistical representation of evolution of properties in so far rather small chemical spaces. But uh, these are all really, I think, baby steps in a way. I think there are many more questions than solutions at the moment. So first of all, we still don't understand what is chemical space, um, how to uh, come up with descriptors which we can, where we can get real insights into chemical space. Um, I've talked about energies, uh, but energies are so-called extensive properties. They scale with molecular size. But they're also very important intensive properties, so electronic properties. They don't scale with molecular size. And for those, machine learning up to now is not very good. Okay? So it's good for extensive properties, but not good for intensive properties. Um, we don't really know how to combine machine learning with higher order symmetries, so electronic symmetries. Okay? Uh, there is some emerging work on how to learn Hamiltonians because you could actually not learn the property itself, but you can learn the Hamiltonian parameters and then you diagonalize, right? And if you do that, you can in principle get all the quantum mechanics that I've just described in the beginning of my talk, right? Directly through the diagonalization. Um, finally, we would like machine learning to suggest better approximations for solution of a Schrodinger equation. And of course, we need more and big data to, to really go there. Thank you very much. <coughs>